Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. This is our last inventory show of the year, and everything you see is for sale. We are waking up with watches. Reach out to me at tmasso at thewatchbox.com to inquire about the pricing of any of these watches. We ship overnight. It is not too late to take delivery by Christmas. And if you're looking to sell, guess what? We will ship your watch in overnight. Sell one watch or an entire collection. For that matter, trade for a watch you'd prefer. If you wish to buy, trade, or sell, reach out to tmasso at thewatchbox.com. All right, let's get rolling. I promised you guys a big piece, and here it is. A watch launched in 2016 based on a model launched in 2000. I never would have guessed that as of 2021, this would probably be the single hottest Rolex model extant, but here we are. And the 40 millimeter 116 ln the ceramic bezel steel Daytona is absolutely the hottest standard steel Rolex of the moment. It is easy to see why. First, the timepiece is eternal, as the basic design coined in 1988 with the first automatic Daytona is still recognizably this watch. So unlike the subs, the sea dwellers, all of which have gone through several different design iterations and case sizes. This watch is actually the most consistent single model in the Rolex catalog over the last 30 plus years. There is no planned obsolescence. There are two versions, of course, white dial and black dial. I prefer this one with the black dial because visually to me, the dial continues unabated, unbroken into the ceramic bezel, which makes the watch read as larger than it is. Now it has plenty of loom. As you can see, it is well loomed with Rolex's chromolite blue loom. It's 100 meters water resistant. It is hugely anti-magnetic for a watch that's not actively billed as an anti-magnetic timepiece. On the wrist, it's thin, 12.4 millimeters thick, so it sits low, it slides underneath the cuff, and it's not excessively broad. It's a good watch for men and for women. In fact, the case, if you look at it closely, has more in common with some of the dress watches, like the Date 8s, the Date Just. There's even a little bit of Yacht Master in there, so it's a more graceful profile on the wrist. And of course, it's got a three-day power reserve, chronometer certified, a vertical clutch, and a column wheel to actuate the chronograph with screw-down crowns and 100 meters of water resistance. There is a lot to love about this hugely versatile Rolex chronograph. And if you love auto racing, this is the winner's gift at the 24 Hours of Daytona. That said, some people will trade their wheels for wings, and the Rolex GMT Master is the Rolex Pilot Watch. Now, it's the only timepiece that I can say flies under the radar from the current GMT collection, because at first glance, this looks like any old Pepsi bezel steel GMT Master, but it is white gold. This is the model made from 2014 to 2018. It is super subtle. The only thing to reveal the composition of the watch, if you're a Rolex expert, you're going to see it. But otherwise, the only real cue is that white gold is warmer in color than steel or platinum. I mean, you can see steel right here and you can see white gold. White gold is still very much gold, which means there's a little bit of the underlying color and warmth of gold in the tone of the case. Now, it has a ceramic bezel with platinum fill. All of the numerals and indices are platinum deposit. Bi-directional bezel with the 24-hour second time zone and the 12-hour local time. You can actually use the GMT offset of the bezel if you set the 24-hour hand to Greenwich, and you will be able to get three time zones simultaneously. First GMT Master II, a true dual time with a third time capability, debuted back in 1983. That's exactly what this is. Now, the case and the bracelet being of white gold give the watch a real heft. Partly because Rolex uses solid case backs, it's heavier than you would expect in this case size, even in precious metal. We have solid end links, solid center links, and a very thick gauge clasp with two locking factors. You have one, which is spring loaded, and then they have the other, which is the clamshell. Pop open the clasp, but you can see that there is the easy link. It is a 5 millimeter tool-free adjustment system, and it's the equivalent of adding or removing one sizable link. Automatic winding, 100 meters water-resistant, well-loomed, 48-hour power reserve, chronometer certified. It has the same anti-magnetic neobium zirconium hairspring that you'll find in the Daytona, and for that matter, in the Milgauss. I suspect every Rolex watch with this hairspring today is 1,000 Gauss anti-magnetic, and the Milgauss a little bit more. So this watch is shock-resistant, anti-magnetic, and water-resistant. It is the full package with a lovely black lacquer dial with white gold hands and indices. White gold, because over time, white gold will not tarnish, oxidize, or change its color. Now, in the world of full bracelet sports watches, there's the Rolex trio of the GMT, the Sub, and the Daytona, and then from Omega, 
The Rejoinder, and the all-time classic for that brand is its iconic Moonwatch. But this is no mean Moonwatch, no. This is the Canopus Gold Omega Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch. 42 millimeters in white gold. This is the latest variant of the watch, modeled loosely after the historic reference 14512 that went to the moon. Some changes, you can see the diagonal dot at 70, you can see the dot over 90. The tachymeter for vintage nostalgic reasons is actually an aluminum insert but the watch features two sapphire crystals the only way to get the canopus gold watch is as a sapphire sandwich variant the dial features two different finishes and it's it's rather subtle as we have a combination of a sunburst at center and then the track outboard is actually a flat metallic grain as you can see we have all applique indices and omega logos so this is an upscale look for the moon watch as the standard moon watch features the same reprofiled dial with the dipping seconds track is this, but the standard moon watch features printed dial furniture. Here it's applique. Now the watch is loomed. We'll take a quick look at the loom. Turn it back on. We have a 42 millimeter moon watch case and th they say cannabis gold is whiter. I'm not sure I'm going to buy that. I'll let you judge for yourself compared to the compositionally similar Rolex gray gold. Both of these are what would be termed gray gold in the industry with a about a 75% blend of gold, and then the rest is a combination of palladium, platinum, and rhodium, and that allows the watch to be white without a rhodium coat on the top. So neither one of these white golds is a different color underneath, and neither one ever needs to be replated with rhodium, which is rare in the world of white gold. You can see there might be a little bit of a whiteness advantage to the canopus gold, but both of these represent the highest quality of gray gold that you'll find in the industry. Now the bracelet on the Omega is designed to look a little bit vintage-y. It has that late 60s vibe to it. There is a taper, which makes it a high quality piece, and many short profile removable links fixed by screws. As you can see, the clasp is also thick gauge, striations outboard, twin trigger release. It's a single fold deployment. There are two micro adjustment notches built in. And then through the reverse side, you can see that this is the caliber 3861, all new to the moon watch. It's a 50 hour power reserve, manual wind, hacking second, cam, lateral clutch, master chronometer, anti-magnetic with a silicon hairspring, and free sprung for the first time in a moon watch caliber. A lot to love here. It is the first coaxial moon watch caliber, the first Metas certified chronometer caliber in a moon watch. And of course, you can see it was designed from the first to have a display case back. So unlike the previous caliber 1861, which used plastic parts, this certainly does not. Nicely executed, you can see there's a break between the rhodium plated brass components that comprise the bridges and the plates and the components of the chronograph which are made out of stainless steel and satinated across their top. It's a sizable watch. At 42 millimeters and all in gold, you can feel the weight of it. It's imposing and impressive, and it's got a unique grayscale appeal to it. It's a low profile attack that comes in fast and hits hard. It sneaks up on you, but once it does, you're really gonna find yourself smitten. This is one of the most exclusive and I must say charismatic of the current generation of moon watches. It's been a long time since we've had a regular production white gold moon watch in the collection, and this is the revival of that. Now, speaking of sports watches, they don't come much more prestigious or sought than Richard Mille. And what we have right here is a model launched back in 2000. And 11, and the idea was to give Richard Mille collectors a round watch option and an ultra thin watch option. RM33 extra flat, that's what we have right here, 45.7 millimeters in diameter, but only seven millimeters thick. It's an impressive thing, and as you can see, they curved it on the reverse side, so there's a camber to the case. So though it is huge at face value, at almost 46 millimeters, you'd think it's gigantic, but being as flat as it is and curved to wrap around the wrist, you could see even I can wear it. A wrist as small as 15 centimeters circumference could wear this well. And it's about as dressy as an RM gets. It's got that lovely techno industrial dial in blackened grade five titanium, but then you've got the case itself, which is surprisingly spare and easy to fit underneath the dress cuff. Plus it is a two hand watch. Flipping it over, it's the GXP1 caliber. It has a uh, Titanium bridges and plates, which you'll note have been skeletonized to reduce the mass. It's a Vauche base. You can see the little Vauche star on the base plate. Platinum rotor, 42-hour power reserve, and it's it's all grayscale from black to silver. They don't even use colored synthetic sapphires. You can see all the pivot stones are clear here, and it's free sprung for durability against shock. So the timepiece, of course, is a remarkably extravagant take 
on the rose gold watch genre. It's elegant as Richard Mille watches go, but you can also see it has that sculptural form, almost like a building halfway completed. You feel like you're looking into the bones of the machine when you look at the hollows of the case blanks. So somehow the watch manages to be both maximalist in its detail and minimalist in its thickness, and that is RM to a T, a dichotomy. All right. As thin as it is, it's got nothing on this. Bulgari Octofinissimo Rose Gold. The dial is Media Blasted Rose Gold. The case and the bracelet, Media Blasted Rose Gold. As my calipers measure it, it is 5.2 millimeters thick and 40 millimeters in diameter. You can see the bracelet is gorgeous, tapered, conforming, integrated with the case. And if you look at the reverse side of the bracelet, you can actually see that the clasp folds into a recess in the side of the bracelet. So when it is closed, it, it remains just as thin as the bracelet links themselves. Closing the clasp does not add to the thickness of the bracelet. Now the watch is simple, three hands, easy to read, high contrast dial, lots to love here with the sculptural form. Bulgari wants to invoke Roman architecture, but to be tr faithful to its origins, uh, the design predates Bulgari's involvement with the Gerald Genta brand. It's a late 90s take on Gerald Genta's traditional jewelry aesthetic. That is, the integration of the case, the lugs, and the bracelet as though the watch were an article of jewelry and not just a timekeeping instrument. Now, zooming in, we're going to take a look at the movement, which is made in the Valet du Jeu at the Le Sentier manufacturer that previous cre previously created Gerald Genta and Daniel Roth high horology watches, and that's where this is made. Caliber BVL138, automatic winding, platinum mass, 60 hour power reserve. The movement is over 36 millimeters in diameter, but only 2.23 millimeters thick, allowing it to fit within this ultra thin case without resorting to gimmicks, like building the base plate of the movement into the case back, which is why you get a conventional case back with the display sapphire. Of course, you can see that it is a combination of manual and hand finish. Honestly, it's as good or better relative to what you'll get from Audemars Piguet. And the detailing is superb, right down to the bevels, which which appear to be started by mechanical means, but finished by manual means. Lovely Cote de Genève, micro engine turning under the rotor, satination on all the wheels, including the micro rotor itself, and black polishing of the screw heads. Now, throwing it on the wrist, you can see it really does sit lower than my wrist hair. So if you want to wear this as a dress watch, you can. Lug to lug, it's only 46 millimeters and 40 millimeters in diameter. So you're going to find that this is a good match for both men and women. You don't need to go with a women's sized watch. Uh, this is a unisex option and a great one. Remember, this model in its titanium form won the GPHG Men's Watch Prize back in 2017. So it is a GPHG Laureate and one of the most awarded watch models of recent years. All right, we're gonna get a little bit crazy here. Patek Philippe. In 2010, Patek Philippe launched the 5170, the successor to its 5070 chronograph. The problem, no one really wanted the original yellow gold, silver dial, Roman numeral, Mark I. This model was launched in 2013, and it is the white gold 5170G-001. Much better. You get a lovely pulsation scale dial with applique breguet Arabic numerals, which is the first thing that catches your attention, but in the white metal case with the silver dial and the white gold hands, the white gold numerals, it has a wonderfully elegant and consistent profile. It doesn't look anachronistic like the original yellow gold 5170J. This is very much a modern watch. Now, it's not as big as it looks. It's 39.4 millimeters in diameter, and it's fairly thin. So when you wear it on the wrist, you can see that this is one for him and for her. Once again, I've got a lot of unisex options on the show today because this is sort of our Christmas shopping show, and I want options for everybody. But it is very thin and low in profile. The case band is simple. The lugs are nicely tapered, and it's an easy watch to read as the contrast between hands and dial, very high. I'm going to Make sure this is wound up because being a modern Patek Philippe in-house caliber, caliber CH29535 Petite Second has a hacking seconds function. So you can see, for example, if I were to start the chronograph and I pull the crown out, it stops. Turning it all over, you can see the movement is gorgeous. It's bigger than the 2770 in the old 5070 chronograph, and you'll appreciate that it's beautifully finished, properly fills the case back. We get a 65-hour power reserve, brigade overcoil, hairspring, free-sprung, gyromax-style regulator, six-position 
position adjustment. We get a capped and black polished column wheel with a traditional fully jeweled lateral clutch and then an instantaneous minute jumper. It's got all of that and beautifully executed. Again, a combination of steel components for the chronograph and then rhodium plated bridges and plates for the rest of the watch. Turning it all over, you can see that there is a full deployment clasp made in matching white gold. Okay. Stepping up in rarity, we have a 1,000 piece limited edition from 2020 that was designed to pay homage to the Patek Philippe Museum that opened in 2019. So this is the Calatrava 6007A. 6007A is a 40 millimeter steel Patek Philippe dress watch. The dial, which they describe as having a carbon pattern at center, I call it a basket weave. It is a slate blue with metallic finish, and you can see it is well loomed, being automatic steel, 40 millimeters in diameter, and remarkably bright at night. This is a sporty take on the traditional Calatrava. Now the watch, as you could see, let me show you the watch, is very thin in profile and has incredibly strong lugs. And I mean just incredibly strong lugs. The case has the appearance of a much larger vessel. And you can see it's all of high polish with a nearly flat domed bezel profile. These lugs are almost Carrera strong. And my favorite feature of them, other than that they are so sweeping and encompassing, is that they round off and there's a wrap around at the end of the lug profiles. You can also see that the hands on the dial are white varnished and all of the numerals are white gold applique. Lots to love right there, but we're upping the ante. That was a 1,000 piece limited edition. This watch is scarcer still, though technically not a limited edition. The 5212A launched in 2019 is a very scarce watch. It draws its case lines from the historic uh, reference 2405, and if you take a quick look, you can see that it is quite spare with a lovely tapered vintage appearance and a sharp break between case band and lug. Taking a quick look at the dial, the font that's used is that of a remarkably well-written Patek Philippe employee. This is actually his penmanship, and he wrote out A through Z, and that became the font on which the weekly calendar was modeled. Now, the dial is a lovely off-white. It's not silver. You can see the date disc is silver white. The dial is a sort of cream color, which makes for a nice warm contrast with the blackened hands and blackened white gold indices. You have your date, you have your day, you have your month of the year. It is a weekly calendar, and the timepiece features the modern Patek Philippe caliber 26 330 base, which means in addition to automatic winding and 45 hours of power reserve, you do get that hacking seconds function. Turning it over, you can see there's not a whole lot to tell between this and the 324. They're both free sprung, both guaranteed to run no worse than minus three plus two seconds per day. Both feature a four hertz beat rate. Both feature an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring. The finishing is on most standard Patek Philippe movements. Is started by mechanical means, that is the cutting of the bridges and the start, but not the finish of the bevel. But the Finishing level here is to a very high degree of quality. It's higher than what you'll find, for example, on a standard Audemars Piguet, JLC, or Glasuta Original. And if you ever want to tell the 26330 apart from the 324 just by a glance, not looking at the reference number on the movement, uh, this little reduction wheel and the change to the bridge adjacent, the adjacent system, right where you'll find the escape wheel and the fourth wheel, the bridge changes, and so does that reduction wheel, and that's how you can tell them apart. Uh, this is a steel watch. Again, stainless steel. We got a lot of steel Patek on the show today. It wears more compact than the other two you just saw. Compared to the huge thrusting lugs of the 6007, this is a lot more tapered. Uh, another 40 millimeter watch, nevertheless, it wears smaller and it looks smaller to the eye. So just keep that in mind. If fit is borderline with the larger 40 millimeter watch, and you want to know how this would fit, think of it as more of a 38 or a 39. All right, give me a moment because I forgot to pop open the vessel for this particular watch, but we've got a Nautilus 5711. You can see this is the silver dial model that came out in 2012. 5711 1A011, 40 millimeters by 8.5 millimeters thick. It actually has the most legible dial of any standard 5711 because the black, white gold, it, they are blackened white gold hands and indices. They stand out starkly from the silver white dial. They're well loomed at night, but the ease of recognition by day is this watch's hallmark. Now the timepiece is 42 millimeters as you measure it from side to side, so the winglets aren't included in the diameter. The diameter is normally measured diagonally on this case. The watch does wear a little bit larger than its rated size. I'm going to throw it on the wrist. This one's a caliber 324, by the way. And it's a nice flat profile. The Nautilus 5711 is suitable for men and women. The 5726 
and the chronograph versions are not. Those almost wear like offshores relative to a standard Royal Oak. Uh, that is what a annual calendar or a 5990 or a 5980 is relative to a 5711. The 5711 and the 5712 both wear nice and compact, flat and short across the wrist. So if you're a lady and you don't want to go midsize or ladies Nautilus, you want to go with a 5711 or you want to go with a 5712. Now this watch right here is uh, very light, very thin, very comfortable, and it could be your dress watch. The market on these is kind of crazy right now. If you're buying with a view to selling in 24 months, I got to be honest, the market might step back a little bit. If you're buying with the idea that this is going to be a generational watch in your family, an heirloom for your kids or grandkids, or maybe just something that you'll sell 10, 15 years down the line, then you'll do fine even if you buy at current prices. Don't take a short-termism view of these watches. Take the long view, and you will never be disappointed. And that's, that's good advice advice for buying any watch. Don't think of it as investment. Think of it as a lifetime companion and an heirloom. And perhaps if you do think of it as an investment, think of it the way you think of real estate, a 401k or an index fund, something for the long haul that will never do you wrong in the long run. Okay. I have two watches, both from Geneva, both from Urwerk. 100 pieces launched in 2016. This is the titanium and red gold Urverk UR105 TA Raging Gold. If you don't want your gold to rage, then you might prefer this. Launched in 2020 and a 25-piece limited edition. This is the UR100 Gunmetal. Okay, basic sizing here. It's about 49 millimeters lug to lug and 41 millimeters across. There is a lot going on, so let's take a quick look at the time display. Urverk created in 1997 by designer Martin Fry and watchmaker Felix Baumgartner. It is a company that focuses on alternative displays at times. The way you read this is quite simple. Uh, there's a scale of 60 minutes at the base. There's a satellite system for the hours of the day. So the currently visible hour is 4. It's on 30. That's simple. That's 4.30. And that's 4.45. If you watch 12 o'clock, you'll see the rotation of these satellites. Now it is 5.30. Now it is 5.45. Now it is 546, and so it pirouettes all day long. It's a take on the Renaissance era wandering hours clock complication. Now there are two subsidiary displays, by the way, in case you're wondering. Yes, it is loomed, and it is gloriously loomed. The satellite is arguably more spectacular by night. Okay, by the way, take a look. You can see what is blue and what is green, and the time scale is green. What is blue... A set of 20-minute scales that reflect how far the Earth travels around the sun in 20 minutes. So, so that's how far the Earth travels around the sun, 35,742 kilometers. It is moving very fast. And then the rotation of the Earth, it will rotate 555.55 kilometers. That's what that represents. Presents. We have a little bit of knurling on the side of the case, and we have a relatively narrow pivoting straps. You'll see the same thing on the 105. This makes the watch easier to wear than the bare dimensions would suggest. It is an automatic winder and features an unusual system for winding its 48-hour power reserve, and the automatic movement is Zenith Elite-based. Taking a quick look now at the Raging Gold. Here we have an engine-turned rose gold case. We do have a similar display of time. I'm going to demonstrate how that works. You can see the satellites work fundamentally the same way, and it's a digital time display. So now you can see it's 4.30, and now it is 4.40. 59, and now it's 505, 506, 507. It's a spectacular thing. You can see, as with the other watch, it does have spectacular luminescence. It also has more, as on the reverse side, you get the ability to control the winding vigor of your watch. Are you an inactive person? Well, you might want to put the winding system, which uses two pneumatic turbine pumps, put that in full. Now, it's going to wind with the slightest motion of the wrist, but you might be a very active person, in which case you may want to lock the winding system entirely to protect against shock. Or you might find that your activity level is somewhere in the middle. You need winding, uh, but at the same time, you're not a couch potato. The choice is yours. Urver gives you that kind of control. The watch is a little narrower across. It is 39 millimeters from side to side, but it's 53 millimeters from lug to lug. Now, taking a quick look, you can see that there's a lot going on. The profiles of the case give you a lot to think about. The watch, of course, retains its Zenith automatic base. It's based on a Zenith Elite as 
automatic Ervic watches are, it's a bigger presence on the wrist. It's thicker than the UR100. The gunmetal is a thinner watch. It's a shorter watch, though a little bit broader. It is much flatter. So this watch really needs to be considered alongside the likes of Debetun, Grubel Forsy, Richard Mille, even an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak concept. It's that kind of extravagant, no holds barred, aesthetic and engineering achievement. And I'll show you one more time the UR100, which is an easier watch to wear. This, this is the one, if, if a lady's gonna buy one of these, this would be the one you'd buy. You wouldn't buy the 105 Raging Gold. This watch doesn't rage. Uh, it's a little bit more cerebral and has that lovely bubble sapphire over its top, which is all encompassing and allows viewing of the mechanism from any angle. Okay, affordable watches? May we? Okay, let's talk about this watch, which was designed by Zinn's Japanese distributors, made by Zinn in Frankfurt. This is known as the Military 3. There were two previous military editions prior to this one. This, the Military 3, is a limited edition that came out in 2013, and there is a lot to love. You can see it's a limited edition of 300 pieces. It's 200 meters water resistant. It is 80,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetic, or middle gauss, and it is tegmented steel, which means it is almost impossible to scratch, as the case and the bezel each are 1,200 Vickers, the hardness of ceramic. You can see it's got a screw-down crown with one, two, three, four layers of knurling. Aesthetically, the goal was to channel the EZM-1 but without plagiarizing the EZM-1. You can see the aesthetic is EZM, or Einsatzzeit Messer Emission Timer, but the case profile is not that of the EZM-1 or 1.1. It doesn't have those angular Carrera-style lugs. These are a little bit more spare, a little bit more tapered. The luminescence is extraordinary, and you can see that there's small seconds on the dial. There is a date with a quick set just above that. The watch has a copper sulfate tablet that is screwed into the side of the case. It's replaced every time the watch goes in for service. Every time it goes in for service, it's going to be nitrogen filled to push out dust, moisture, and impurities. And then that little tablet's going to be inserted, and that will pull out any moisture that might work its way into the case. So the watch is shock resistant, water resistant, scratch resistant, anti-magnetic, and it features what's known as a captive bezel. This is a timing bezel, so it turns in both directions, not a dive bezel. It gives you a zero to 60 minute count up timer, and the timepiece features a captive bezel structure. So you see these little screws in the side of the bezel? Those fix the bezel to the case, so you can't accidentally snap it off by impact. So blunt force trauma can't decapitate this watch the way it can a Tag, an Omega, or a Rolex, for example. This is a very tough watch. It has a Zinn factory strap, which as you can see is massive, with multiple layers of differentially treated leather, contrasting aviator-style stitch, no crimping, no gouging, and there is a media-blasted steel pin buckle to match. These things are incredibly hard. I can gouge my watch, which has tegment, Here's my 1.1. I've gouged the case flank many times to demonstrate this to friends and other enthusiasts. It will take chunks out of your key. The key will not gouge the case. That's the benefit of tegament. Jumping to German-speaking regions of Switzerland, most watches made in Switzerland are made in the French-speaking regions. But in Schaffhausen, one manufacturer stands above the others. And there are only two, Moser and IWC. This is the 5021, the first generation Portuguese or perpetual calendar from 2003. Now, as initially launched, it gave you everything. Moon phase in the northern and southern hemisphere. We have a seven-day power reserve with a power reserve indicator. We have a perpetual calendar. We have the IWC mechanically programmed Kurt Klaus perpetual calendar, which allows me to adjust Everything, the moon, the day, the date, the month, even the year and the decade, as easily as if this were a date just with a quick set. You don't have to look up the day, date, month, and the moon phase. Just set the correct day for the month you're in, assuming you get the year right, and everything else, including the moon phase, is mechanically programmed. Now, we also have hacking seconds. We have the seven-day power reserve indicator coaxial with the day of the week, or the date, I should say, at three o'clock. We have applique Art Deco style Arabic numerals, and of course the Portugueser, which features a blended lug case, leaf hands, and a small second subdial, is of the same 1930s form follows function school of thought as its contemporary 
the Patek Philippe 96, although they are dramatically different in scale, the original Calatrava and the original Portugueser feature design cut from the same cloth, and you can see the early 2000s IWC fish crown rather than the Probus Scafusia crown. Now, this is the 50... 611. So this is the reference 50611. It's based on the original caliber 5000 variant of the IWC 7-day automatic, which is why you see an eccentric screw for the fine adjustment indicator. It's adjusted in five positions. It has an overcoil hairspring. The big difference between this and later variants is this has a very slow pocket watch-like beat rate of about 18,000 vibrations per hour. And as you can see, it uses the IWC Peloton Paul-based winding system. So Albert Peloton invented this for IWC in the late 40s. It was industrialized in the 50s. It remains a very efficient and shock tolerant winding system. The movement is over 37 millimeters in diameter and when it first debuted it was the world's largest automatic movement and it remains among the largest today. There is an enormous polished and media blasted rose gold medallion inside the winder and this timepiece wears with a great deal of drama but unlike the Urwerk that you saw earlier, this one doesn't have quite the bombast. It's large but it carries its weight with grace. It's got a zaftig grace to it and a timepiece that does everything with good manners. It is a dress watch. The Portuguese are in 1939. Reference 325 was the first modern oversized dress watch. And this watch is true to that heritage. These models, the 5021s, in the first few years of production were made in very low numbers. So reach out and seize this opportunity if you like this one. We don't get the 5021 too often. Even, even with three to 4,000 watches here per year, Year, three to four thousand watches cross my desk. I've only seen a handful of these. FP Jorn. What don't you see too often? You don't see them on bracelets. And let me just grab the little rubber wrap off this one. But this is the Sun. This is the Tourbillon Souverain discontinued model. It's the Tourbillon Souverain as it was made from uh, 2004 through 2018, platinum 40 millimeters, factory five link platinum bracelet, rose gold dial, and a lovely thing, as you can see, it has a deadbeat second, the tourbillon axis sweep seconds, it's got a 42 hour power reserve, but having a chronometer style, a power reserve indicator, means the power reserve indicates zero when fully wound. For the first 28 hours of power reserve, and I'll demonstrate how this works to the best of my ability, but for the first 28 hours of power reserve, uh, this watch, includes a remontoir de galette, which ensures that the constant force to the escapement for 28 hours maintains constant amplitude. So the watch exhibits outstanding isochronous qualities. The movement is made of rose gold. The case is made of platinum. When you throw it on the wrist, it's got a lot more presence than a standard 40 millimeter Journe Tourbillon Souverain because it does have a broad link to link span. The end links across the wrist mean I think this watch is suitable for a wrist no smaller than 15 centimeters circumference. It really is quite broad and all in platinum with a rose gold dial and a rose gold movement. I mean, this thing feels like it weighs a pound in spite of being a 40 millimeter watch. It is thin, so it's going to slide underneath the cuff. If you're someone with a smaller wrist and you want to buy it for its collectible qualities, and just put the bracelet in the case, store it away for posterity, and then put the watch on a strap and you'll be able to wear it on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. Now we're going to jump at the opportunity to take a look at another FP Journe watch. Uh, this one is a little bit more manic than the tourbillon. This is a timepiece that originally won the GPHG Aiguille back in 2007 and for years was the only chronograph in the Journe catalog. It is the Santograf Souverain. Let me fire this one up. Oh, I just got a note that I'm not allowed to show you this Santograf Souverain. Very well. Okay. I, I have a Santograph in platinum that I'm not really supposed to show you. Sorry about that. <laughs> we jump straight to the piece de resistance. Launched in 2019 and a revelation that changed people's view of Debatoon. This is the DB28 GS Grand Bleu. The Grand Bleu 
is not the first sports watch from Debitun, but it is the most capable. There is a lot to unpack here. First, screw down crown, rotating dive style bezel, one of the few center second DB28s you'll ever encounter. Still with the floating lugs, 44 millimeters in diameter, but only 13 millimeters thick. The watch includes static luminescence by Black Badger. So if you're familiar with James Thompson and Black Badger, you know that he is the go-to guy for looms and extravagant offbeat dials. But this watch has something more. It has dynamos that power four LEDs. There's a backlit dive bezel, both barrels, five-day power reserve, run the lighting system. You can see the power reserve indicator off to the left, and you can see that there is a minute repeater style governor right under the broad arrow minute hand. So that slows down the discharge of power. You can see it really does light for quite a while. That power reserve declines relatively slowly. There is a lot to love with this watch. It's super light, wieldy, comfortable on the wrist, better built frankly, than a Richard Mille, and better detailed, as you can see, traditional fine finish, including black polishing, fired blue components, mirrored unglage a mile wide, and this micro light engraving that is what Debitun does instead of traditional guilloche or Côte de Genève. They have these narrow strakes that are engraved by manual reductive means. One, two, three shock protection springs, a titanium and white gold balance with a two-element clamped hand-formed hairspring. The idea is that you get a flat hairspring that breathes concentrically like an overcoil but is not subject to the thickness or shock susceptibility of an overcoil. Now you turn it all over and you can see the mechanism that underpins the power reserve indicator. You can see a little bit unusual 105 meters water resistant rather than 100 but Debitun always gives you more. More micro light engraving on the back, as well as mirrored unglage on the edges of the components and satination over the bridge at center. It is a beautifully hand finished watch from a company that's made fewer than 3,000 watches since its founding back in 2002. And the company makes about 200, 220 watches a year now. This is probably the best value in ultra high tech avant garde high horology. Compared to RM, even compared to the Grubel 4C Balancier S, the pricing, the engineering, the finishing of this puts it in a class by itself as there's really nothing else like it. The only other folks doing dynamo lights are HYT, indisposed for the moment, and this is a more successful implementation because there's a purpose to it. It is specifically, again, to backlight a diving bezel when you take the watch in the water, and that it does to a T. A watch that offers everything and leaves nothing to be desired. This was my favorite new watch of 2019, and it remains one of the absolute best divers in the world to this day. Reach out to tmasso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.